So Susan, you have the floor. Okay. How much time do I have? Okay. As long as you need, Susan. Okay, I'm just going to make it quick. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. I hope more people will join us. Uh, we're going to all be perfectly silent, and uh, until it's until it's time to speak, and then we the vestry and the rest of the chorus wants to hear your questions. But first, Amber's going to speak for about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, it would be great if everyone could listen to the questions that are asked, and then you know we wouldn't duplicate them, and it would be a little, a little more um, conducive to a good meeting. Okay, we're going to start with our prayer for the parish, our search process, and I have it in front of me, and I don't know if you do or not, but please pray with me as we pray. Dear Lord, in this season of change, we pray for our parish of Christ Church and our vestry. Guide us that we may be patient in our discernment, steadfast in our commitment, and imaginative about our future. We look to your wisdom and companionship in our journey to find a rector who will enlighten and inspire us through preaching who will engage us through teaching, who will encourage us to serve others, and who will motivate us to celebrate the gospel in word and deed. All this we ask so that we may all come to know the love of Christ more deeply. Amen. And may I introduce Amber Gear from the Office of Transition Ministry in the Diocese. Uh, many of you have not yet met her. And Amber, we're so happy uh, that this day has finally come, that we get to have this conversation. So thank you. Me too. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. And really my pleasure to be with you. Um, and I am going to just get started. I know you guys have lots of questions. So I do have a little presentation we'll go through. And then if you have questions, I am here to answer them. So. All right, just give me one second because I am a bit technologically challenged. All right, we're going to do share screen. And I'm going to think, hmm, I think this is the right one. Are you guys seeing a PowerPoint? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I did something right. Okay. I do appreciate that. All right. Hold on. But now, okay. Got this. <clears throat> All right. So, um, again, thank you for um, joining me tonight. So we can just kind of talk a little bit about, talk about a couple of things. And right now I'm just trying to get some more of you on my screen. So that way I feel like I'm not just talking to myself. Uh, <laughs> sit in my basement talking to myself. Um, so, all right. A clergy transition. We're going to talk a little bit about the landscape right now of what clergy, the landscape of clergy in denomination right now. So this church is not the church that most of us have grown up. In. And um, because of that, and several other factors, we um, kind of changed how the search process was. So those of you who have been on search committees in the past, um, most likely, Everything is, well, I know that everything is very different from what you've done. <clears throat> so one of the big things now is we are experiencing a very large clergy shortage. This is not just in the Episcopal Church. This is across a lot of denominations, um, but it's definitely in the Episcopal Church. And here's just some facts and figures about this. Um, some of the most stunning ones are that currently there are 250 ordinations to every 400 retirements. And between 2018 and 2026, 40% of the Episcopal Church active priests will retire. And that statistic was from the end of 2019. So you throw 2020 in there and COVID has led to people retiring early or taking a break from ministry. So that just brought the numbers down even more. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's just, 
it's, it's just a reality. That's kind of what we're working with. <clears throat> so here in Connecticut, um, less than 33% of our parishes have or want full-time clergy. We have 150 parishes. 100 of our parishes are part-time. Part-time is anything from three-quarter down. Actually, I have an 85% priest. We do have some that are these um, unique percentages, and we figure that out. But we have an 85%. But it's anything that's not full-time. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's an assumption that most of our parishes are full-time, maybe even have two priests. No, nope. And because of the part-time, because of the clergy shortage, because of a lack of interim priests, because um, a lack of mobility with priests, the old model, well, and other reasons we'll get into in a minute, the old model of having an interim come in, your priest leaves, an interim comes in, there's a search committee formed, 18 months later, hopefully a call is made. That's no longer effective. A lot of our parishes um, are limited in resources in terms of, of people and their capacity and their time and their uh, bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So asking 12 to 15 of your gifted leaders to please, you know, sequester themselves on this special, you know, committee doesn't help because the, the, the parish still has to function and we need leaders keeping the parish going. <clears throat> And as I mentioned, interim ministers, those doing it these days is very small. And the process, if you have participated in an, in an old search process that was about 18 months long, it did, it taxed a lot of resources. So what are we doing about that? Well, we're trying to shift from maintaining the 20th century church to figuring out what it is God wants us to be now. <laughs> the circumstances for ministry uh, are radically different and are constantly changing, just like our culture is. Um, and of course, all everything sped up over the last three years. So we need to focus on who God's calling us to become. And that involves a sense of curiosity and trying things on. Everything I talk about tonight, what's happening tonight, as a, you know, we have a new bishop, there are things... Um, we have a new bishop. The world still is changing so quickly. I mean, so this is the parameters we're working through and working with now. <clears throat> have been for the last two years. I just like to say that because if at some point we're like, hey, we're going to change gears, we're going to try something else on. I just want everybody within the state of Connecticut to have heard that whatever we're doing is provisional. So we have been working under Transitions, the New Normal, which was rolled out in February of 2020. So it, um, we already knew we had the clergy shortage. We knew we had a lot of things coming up, a lot of things that we now have because we figured we had 10 to 15 years. But of course, COVID accelerated everything. Um, and a lot of our parishes are in a place now that we thought they might be in 10 to 15 years which is why we're always trying on new things. We're trying to be flexible. And we also all have to keep remembering that the church doesn't exist for itself, but we're here to be God's hands and feet and transform the world through his messages and helping be part of the reconciliation of all relationships so that everybody's in right relationship with each other, with God, with our earth. So that's what we're here for. And for the last 2,000 years, the church has been changing, and God will ultimately get what God needs, and on God's time frame, which is sometimes a little frustrating. But <clears throat> So we do all this work under the framework of what we call the definition of a parish in the new missional age. This definition came about, uh, I think it was like six or seven years ago now, a group um, from ECCT. Um, which included both bishops at the time was Ian and uh, Laura and a couple of canons were somewhere down around like Baltimore or something with seven or eight other dioceses. And they're trying to figure out what this new missional age is. And in relationship to that, what a community, a functioning community or parish is into the, in, in that world. So um this is at the forefront of like all that we think about in terms of having theological imaginations, 
where our hearts and minds are moved by God's presence in our lives, in our neighborhoods, and in the world. Uh, we're fed by word and sacrament, where our stories connect with God's story and Holy Scripture, and where we experience God's grace in baptism and Eucharist. Forming disciples and apostles in God's mission, where people grow as followers of Jesus, and then are sent out by the Holy Spirit into the world to join God's work of restoration and reconciliation and connected to the wider body of Christ by sharing our lives with companions of Christ across the Episcopal Church in Connecticut and the wider church. Um, that connection is very important. You guys are down in Guilford. I'm gonna guess South Central, South Central region. So you're part of the South Central region, which is part of ECCT. We're part of province one, which is essentially New England. And that, of course, we're part of Tech, the Episcopal Church, which is part of the Anglican Communion. So, you know, when you think about how we're all these little specks in this great big thing, and we're all connected. And of course, um, forming disciples is very important to what most of us do, where we want to grow as followers of Jesus, we want to receive his message, and then we want to go out into the world and, and live his message and spread his message. We are fed by scripture, and obviously our sacraments are very important to us. Um, baptism, Eucharist, although Eucharist does not need to be every Sunday. Um, that is a pretty new thing. And we are a place of theological imagination where um, <clears throat> the stories, the stories move us, the stories from the Bible, the stories people share, the stories of grace that people have. I mean, <clears throat> and, you know, we're open for discussions and interpretations. And I mean, that's one of the beauties of our, of our um, nomination. So we are gonna ask that the parish has a meeting and do a self-study. Very easy, it's four questions based on this definition. And so just some things to kind of get your brains going so you can start thinking of your thoughts when you have the meeting. <clears throat> questions to think about. How are we living into these aspects? Where's God in this? Where's God in Guilford? Where's God in uh, Christ Church? What does it mean to be the church in Guilford in 2023? What kind of leaders does God need here and now? How are we living into those promises that we make and we renew in baptism every time we say our baptismal covenant? <clears throat> we need to stop doing. I think COVID helped with this one just because some things just had to stop and some things have not been um, restarted. There are times where, you know, a parish, it's hard when it's part of your history and part of your identity that, you know, you were the, you had the peach festival and, you know, the peach pies were famous in the area and everybody used to come and it raised money that went for outreach and it was wonderful and everyone was involved and you know, there's generational stories of so-and-so and my grandmother did this and my, you know, grandchildren are working with their grandparents on it. And then, you know, you look at an event like that today and you're like, oh, we have four families that are killing themselves trying to push just, you know, make this happen. Um, and, you know, we get this sort of return on it, but that's who we are. And sometimes it's time, you know, it's good to step back and look at what you're doing and being like, is, is this really what we should do? Because when you stop something, you leave room for something new, either to bubble up or the Holy Spirit to present something. So again, I think COVID really helped with this and helps people think about this a little bit more. Who else can you work with engaging in God's mission in Guilford? Yeah, I know that you guys do do other things. Like, <laughs> and how have you been and what, how will you be changed by COVID? So these are just the sort of questions to be thinking of. Um, the actual self-study is four questions based on like our strengths, our challenges, um, and that sort of thing. And I have sent that on to Michael and Susan, so they do have it if they haven't shared it already. Um, we're going to just talk for a second about part-time parishes, because I think it's really important. Again, we're 150 parishes in 169 towns. It's a little silly. Um, and... That means we all have neighbors not too far. And I, I think it's important for us all to be aware of what our so kind of like what our neighbors might be living. So letters of agreement for part-time parishes, anything less than half time has a year to year letter of agreement. 
And that simply allows for flexibility because sometimes those parishes, the finances are pretty, <laughs> pretty on the edge and we want to um, be faithful both with the parish and the priest. So this allows them, they renew automatically if everybody wants them to, but if at some point, you know, there's a meeting with the vestry and the parrot or the priest and, and you know, it just allows for a, a flexible way to be faithful. <clears throat> a parish that isn't full-time has to identify at least two parishioners that are licensed to be worship leaders to lead morning prayer because if a priest is not full-time, they can't present every Sunday. Um, this is to allow lay leaders to be um, brought up to be supported, to be a part of the services, because as I said earlier, I mean, um, Eucharist every Sunday is fairly new when you look at our history. And um, for a while, there wasn't a lot of raising up of lay leaders to the detriment of our entire church, big church. So um, to try to help with that, we have, you know, we're trying to raise up more worship leaders Features, um, because everybody everybody's gifted in some way and should be able to share their gifts. So essentially, <clears throat> the minimums for a part-time priest, quarter time is one Sunday a month. Uh, part to half time is two Sundays, three quarter time is three Sundays. I actually only have two quarter time priests that are only in a parish one Sunday, and that's because they're three quarter in another parish. Um, and they everybody knew that going into it. So that's kind of what's happening out there. <clears throat> so you guys are going full time. Um, so as we talked, there's no more interims or search committees. The vestry is going to be doing the work. Um, and all parishes in, in this, this case work with a priest in charge. And your priest in charge will come with a, a three-year letter of agreement. And unlike an interim, if after three years, actually usually after two years, you start doing the check-ins, um, your priest in charge can be called as your rector. Or if after two years, um, you know, you guys feel like maybe things should go in another direction. It again, allows the flexibility for those conversations to be had and you're not talking to someone with tenure. So um, your priest in charge will be part of a monthly colleague group uh, that's facilitated by Tim Hodap, the canon um, for coaching and mission advancement. And they meet monthly to talk about subject matter, like subject experts, um, for colleague support, for learnings, um, and also to be kept up to date on things. So it's a, it's a good group. They really seem to enjoy it. Um, and that is mandatory for all priests in charge with a three-year letter of agreement. So what's the difference between the rector and a priest in charge? Well, canonically, they're the same. <clears throat> they have the same things. The only thing is if the rector's elected and approved by the bishop, where the priest in charge is appointed by the bishop in consultation with the vestry, our bishops will not appoint somebody that the vestry does not ask for. Um, the we will ask that the wardens send an email to Bishop Mello as he is the Bishop of Record for this transition. So you will have to send an email to him saying, please, we, you know, we would really like to, and we've spoken with so-and-so and we'd like him to be, or her to be appointed our priest in charge. I will not put somebody in that you don't ask for. And then a rector does have tenure where a priest in charge is for a time certain, which again allows for flexibility. Um, <clears throat> oh, I had a thought and it's disappeared. Um, Oh yes, Bishop of Record, just for, because I mentioned Bishop Miller as Bishop of Record. So we have about 65 parishes in trans, some form of transition in Connecticut right now. And uh, that's a lot. So the bishops just simply split the list and Bishop of Record simply means that that is the bishop that is handling the administrative stuff for a transition. So like if you have out-of-state candidates come to interview, they have to meet with Bishop Jeff while they're here. Um, because he's the Bishop of Record. He will be the one to sign the letter of agreement. He'll be the one to make the appointment. This does not mean that Bishop Lohr is not your bishop either. So I ask that if, you know, a year from now, 
two years from now, four years from now, there's a reason to call a bishop. You don't call the diocese and say, I need to talk to J Bishop Jeff. He's the bishop. He's, a, he's our bishop or he's our bishop of record. Like It is strictly, Laura is just as much your bishop. It's just he's handling the administrative side of this transition. That is all. Um, so the appointment of the priest in charge. Another change is we don't do shiny profiles anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, your website is your advertisement. And I can tell you that when it was announced that Harrison was leaving, people are already looking at the website. The parish is gonna participate in the self-study that we were talking about um, regarding the questions around the definition of the new missional age. And that's gonna be to help the vestry prepare the parish materials. That includes their questions for interviews. Then there's some profiles we do. Mm -hmm. So first there's the OTM profile. This is the Office of Transition Ministry. This is through the Episcopal Church um, and it's a national clearinghouse where parishes that are looking for priests, usually three quarter to full time, post um, the position. There are narratives that need to be answered. They have character counts and that can get a little annoying to try to say what you wanna say in that space, but they're very unforgiving. Um, so, the vestry will be filling these out and they're going to be using the information and the stories they hear um, from the parish meeting to help answer these questions. Because it's very important that these are essentially your dating profiles and you wanna make sure that they represent the parish, not just the vestry. So, um, so even if you're more of an introvert or a little bit more quiet, even if you wanna like, slip Susan or Michael notes like so you can talk like just to make sure that your thoughts and your hopes um and your dreams and your fears and every you know the, the questions you have are being represented so there's the OTM profile and then there's the TMC which is a transition ministry conference um it is a smaller group of dioceses it's about Chicago over North Carolina up I was just with um a bunch of them in North Carolina two weeks ago. And um, it is a much easier profile to do. And it's another clearinghouse that priests look at for jobs. <clears throat> so those are two things that the vestry is gonna do. We will be posting the position when it's ready to be posted. It'll go on OTM, TMC, we've got a lot of acronyms here. ENS, which is the Episcopal News Service, we'll put it up there. And it'll be on our website and go out in our clergy e-news. And then you guys can spread the word. So if your, your hairdresser's sister's dentist's brother is a priest, feel free to reach out and say, hey, I got a great parish for you. Um, anything though has to come through my office. So feel free to you know, send an email or call and say, hey, can you reach out to so-and-so? Or you reach out and say, hey, can you call Amber? Um, that's fine, that's absolutely work it work you work those social networks um the identities of candidates is confidential please do not ask the vestry for names or like where people are from they cannot share that information they will keep you in the loop of like what's happening like we're receiving names we received eight names we um are starting we're doing the first round of interviews but they cannot share names these are people's livelihoods so we can't, the Episcopal church is small and Connecticut's microscopic. And we don't need a priest out in California to have someone in their parish say, I heard you were in Connecticut last weekend. Oh, why? <laughs> like, we don't need that. So um, they cannot, don't get upset with them. They're doing what we're going to tell them a million times that they can't share confidential information. So, um, Let's see, where else are we? So it will be posted as priest in charge with an option of converting to rector. This is more and more common throughout a lot of dioceses. So this is not something unusual that priests are calling me and saying, what does this mean, Amber? Uh, they absolutely know what it means. Yes, we have had people move to Connecticut from other time zones, even though it was a three-year PIC. So I always get, well, no one's gonna move. Uh, I beg to differ. Um, all applications come to me first for vetting. Um, the vetting I do, I do not do reference checks. That's going to be up to Susan and Michael. My vetting is simply when somebody applies and every candidate that applies submits the same information, they send a letter of interest 
they have to do an OTM profile too. So they have to do the same, I'm going to use the word obnoxious, questions that the parish has to and their resume. So the, the vestry will receive the same materials for each priest. Um, but when they submit their names, I have to do some places call it a red flag check, some call it a pre-flight check. I essentially call my colleague in their diocese and say, hey, they've applied any red flags, any reason they can't do it. Um, and as long as they don't say this is a bishop to bishop call, <laughs> um, then you know we, the name gets to go forward. So again, that's just, that's level that I do. Those reference checks go to the wardens. So we will post, once we post the position, we'll leave it up there for <clears throat> six, eight weeks, seven weeks. And it's kind of depends when it gets posted. Um, and then we'll collect the names. And after that, I will meet with the vestry to give them the names and give them the information. The interview process will include an interview with Bishop Mello, like I said, because he is the Bishop of Record. So that just means that any priest will have to interview with him too. But it's usually, that's more important with the out-of-staters because they, he has to meet with them while they're here. It has to be worked into the visits. Um, if they're here in Connecticut, the bishops always figure out a way to connect with people that are local. And then the vestry will make their decision and ask the bishop to appoint the PIC. So the vestry will be inviting you all to give input for the profiles. The website will make sure it's up to date and includes a transition page. I mean, last time I checked, it was looking good. You have amazing wardens and the meetings that they've been holding to keep everybody in the loop. I wish, I wish more parishes had the communication that your parish has. Um, the openings will be listed. It'll be in the e-news and on ENS. Use your networks to get the word out. The vestry, while the post position is posted, the vestry will have to partake in the um, interview and anti-bias or unconscious bias training. It was a vestry resolution years ago. It's a 90 minute to two hour Zoom call that we do with Canon Runge at Matthews and myself. It can be fun if people interact. Um, and then you guys need to pray because we know that the right priest is out there. Um, we just need to make sure that they know that this is, this is where they're coming. <clears throat> so that is a lot of information for me to throw at you. And I know that, and I try not to talk too fast, um, but I also know that that happens too. So feel free to ask any questions that you have. What I'm going to do, if it's okay, is ask uh, folks to raise their hands. Um, and I need to unpin that. There we go. Okay. And um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a reaction uh, sign. And that is where you can uh, raise your hand. I see Kate's raised her hand, and I do notice that Kate has the last name Hagens. That's true. <laughs> true. What's your question, Kate? Thank you, Amber. Actually, that that was a very helpful summary, I think, for, for me at least. Even though I've heard a, a lot of this in the course of where Christchurch has been for the last seven, eight months, that was really very helpful for me to hear some of the overall statistics. It's not exactly um, it's not exactly good news, but it makes Christchurch and our situation in Guilford seem more the norm and less dire. Absolutely, in, in and that's way. why I try to make sure everyone gets the information because so many everyone feels alone or it's only our parish or we're you know no 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 <laughs> and we're people of resurrection and hope so i know the numbers kind of i mean i'm not a number person i'm a touchy-feely like emotional person but i get that the numbers can be a little frightening but again people hope other i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna take this as i did an amazing job if nobody has questions <laughs> 
Other questions from folks? You can raise a physical hand too. Oh, Gabrielle. Hi. Um, I guess I'm wondering when is this parish meeting going to be and do we get to see the questions beforehand? Because I always think of great things afterwards. I am not sure when the wardens are going to schedule that. And I think it's a great idea for them to make sure everybody has the information prior to the meeting so you can be thinking about it. Okay. And I will um, send this presentation over to them too so they can share that too so you can see those other questions. Thanks. Susan, can, can you answer? You've got some, some things in the works uh, that may answer some of Gabrielle's question there. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, actually, we sent out the first question in a in a recent um, one in my last week's letter. But we definitely we will be dealing with those questions. We think maybe one at a time. I don't know if we can do them all all at once. I, Amber, do you have a suggestion that whether it's better to just try to do it one at a time or? You no, know, it's it's totally up to how that parish works. You know, the back of the form does have a suggested format and that works for some parishes and not others. Um, a parish that I met with this week, they're actually gonna hold two parish meetings um, because they felt they couldn't, every, every parish is different. They felt they'd lose too many eight o'clockers to do it after 10 and not enough 10 o'clockers would come enough, you know, come early enough. So the vestry was splitting up to do a post eight o'clock and a post 10 o'clock meeting. Well, that's nice. I like I like the idea of the vestry being fully engaged. Um, right now, we're planning on we've had one one question one uh, session kind of like on the sixteenth I believe that was of of March, and we're going to have another one. Let's see, was it the sixteenth? I don't know, but anyway, it was a couple of weeks ago. And then we're going to have another one right the week right after Easter, which is called Low Sunday. So maybe a lot of people won't be there, but they might. We'll have a, a meeting during the coffee hour again. And then the following Wednesday, we want to have an in-person meeting. And we'll, we'll send all this out. But for those who prefer to go during the day, and then, uh, then we'll also have an evening uh, Zoom perhaps another evening Zoom, and we'll definitely have at least two meetings after or during coffee hour toward the end of March, the beginning of April. No, no. the end of April. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. end of April. I don't know what month this is. And so we're planning at least three chances for people to participate. Um, if we'll work that out with the vestry, but that's where we are right now. But our next one is scheduled for the Sunday after Easter during coffee hour. And we will have those questions written out and we'll have, you know, big pieces of paper people can write on and we'll split you up and get into conversations and really try to not put people on the spot when they have hard questions to ask, but to make it a, a community discussion. Great, Thank thanks, Susan. Uh, Lisa? I just wanted to ask Amber, do most churches handle collecting that information with in-person meetings like Susan is talking about? Is yes. that proven to be the most? Yes, because that's, that's where people are gonna share their stories. Is you know conversation, so mm -hmm. in person. And the thing is, so here's the thing, guys. If we want to kind of compare this to, because these questions are going to be like you know used to write your dating profiles, because you're hopefully going to find a priest and you're going to date for the next three years, and then you're going to decide whether or not to put a ring on it. So you want to be as authentic as possible, because you want them to be just as authentic when they are interviewing because nobody wants to be in this position 18 months, two years from now, because, you know, a priest is like, well, that's not what I thought I was getting into. Or the parish is like, that's not who we thought we were getting. 
So it really is better to just make sure that it's all out there. And if you say something like, well, we have no conflict, that raises red flags because every system has some conflict. It might not be big. It might be that some people want the bulletin to have the entire worship service in it and some don't. They want to be using, I mean, but there's something there. So don't act like there's nothing because that would be weird. We're human. So, so I just want, you know, when you're having these, sharing these stories and you're having this time together to just be real, be real. So. Thanks, Amber. Um, appreciate that, uh, that observation about us uh, being real. I think we all try to be real all the time, pretty much. Uh, no, but sometimes, you know, when people are putting together those dating profiles, they want it yeah, to be okay. nice and shiny. Like, pick me, pick me. All but, right. you know, again, we want authenticity. Um, so here's a fair warning. Um, I noticed other hands are not up. So uh, in the next round, I'll just start calling on people randomly <laughs> uh, to think. <laughs> Some people are saying they don't want that to happen. That's okay too. Uh, Lisa. I'm sorry, if nobody else is gonna ask a question. I'll ask, I'll ask another one. Okay. I feel like our church has also kind of been in a position where we're trying to decide sort of what's important to us, maybe mm -hmm. in our maybe in our outreach or in our activities or in areas that we we feel like where where we need to focus on. I think, you know, there's probably a lot of ideas right now and, and maybe we're not at the point where we're gonna all come together and say, you know, we wanna, you know, put elder care or youth or outreach or, you know, whatever. Um, and I don't know if that's something we're necessarily gonna figure out for this profile too. So, um, you know, how specific do you have to be in telling the you know these candidates sort of who your church is and what you do and what you expect to be doing because I I think that's going to be a bit of an evolving process for us as well. It is an involved process to try to write those narratives and reflect be reflective of the parish and what you've just said is exactly okay to say. Like we're trying to figure that out right now. You know, with times have changed, things have changed. We're you know trying to it, it's back to the question of figuring out who you are, what kind of leaders, what does, you know, Guilford need now? Who can you partner with for these things? Like, it's just saying, we are trying to figure that out. And we'd love somebody to walk with us and help us do that is authentic and your, your truth. And in interviews, you can have other conversations if, you know, if they say, well, what sort of things are you thinking? Like that can happen in an interview. Yeah, I guess in some conversations we've had, you know, we've heard that maybe different candidates might have special specialties or areas of interest. They do. Everybody has their gifts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody's being bashful. Oh, Donna raised her hand. Donna raised her hand. She didn't hold the folder up. She just... <laughs> I'm the silly one. Um, hi, Amber. Thank you very much. Great job. I guess I'm wondering. I I don't. I can't remember if we've been told timeline. I'm a, um. So we're gonna have these questions and this this thing to write up, and then then it's gonna be summertime. And how are we gonna be engaged then? So I guess it's timeline, and then how can we stay engaged? Because if I remember correctly, we should have somebody by October. Is that correct? That, that is the, the budget that we've developed and our, the vestry's hope to have somebody uh, on board by the 1st of October. But that's, that's, not a guarantee, that's not a guarantee. So um, I did leave my crystal ball at the office, but um, a lot depends on how long it takes to get this data prepared and get the profiles done. And then it does matter on when we post, because that's why I said we sometimes, depending, it all depends when we post, how long we keep it up. Um, I've been doing transitions. I've been the DTM for two years since Leanne Tolzman um, 
retired. And prior to that, I worked with Leanne for five years. August is not an active month in the church. So, um, so we kind of work around that. If, if somebody's like, well, we're going to post the last week of July and I'll be like, okay, well, we're leaving it open until at least mid-September because August, because even priests that might be interested in looking at other parishes, if they're in a parish, they're getting ready for the program year. You know, they still have their responsibilities to do. So um, it's, it's tough to say what the timeline would be. Um, I would make sure that you have supply or you've talked mm -hmm. to the retired priests in your parish and I'm not looking at you Marianne um but <laughs> you know for for coverage um probably until at least October November because here's another thing is if you end up coming you know you end up with somebody and you're interviewing in the fall even early fall if they have a family they might not I mean if they by the time they give notice at their parish prepare to if they're moving and then they're like, my, they might want to be like, you know, I'm going to let my kids, like, I'll move my kids during Christmas, like, in, like during the break, like, it seems to be a, a popular time. So there's, there's a, a chance, like, I don't want to, like, you know, make people be like, oh, no, like, your person might not start till January 1st, or January, you know, depending. I mean, it could be a single person that's living fancy free and taking a sabbatical, you know, for the last year and a half, because they were just spent from COVID, and they're like, I'm ready to go back in a parish. And like, yeah, I can be there in two weeks. Like, well, we don't know. Right. We just don't know. Amber? Yes. Yeah, let me let me tag on to uh, to Donna's Donna's question. Um, uh, from the time we get our information to you, let's start the clock there. Okay. That will tell us how rapidly we will get that information to you. And again, this, I don't have a crystal ball because I have had parishes. So what we'll do is I'll give the um, vestry the names. We will ask that the wardens reach out to every candidate within 24 oh. hours. I, let, yep. it, starts, it starts back a little bit, a uh, little bit sooner than that for a moment. And wow. that is from the time we give you Oh, the information that you've asked us to provide. Um, How that long? depends. It depends on whether or not Bishop Mello and I are, are together. Um, if it if it comes in, if he's at some sort of like assuming assuming that we've uh, within a week, we should be able to approve it. We assume, yeah, of course. I appreciate that you're, and then it would get posted. Necessary step. Let's right. assume for the moment that we provided the information in a form that you can, in fact, and do approve, then. It would be posted within 24 to 48 hours, probably. And then what happens? And then the vestry during that time will do the unconscious bias training and you guys pray because there's nothing that can be done while we're taking names other than you talking to your own networks. No, but when you're saying you're taking names, is that the four to six week period? Correct. Okay. All right. Good. Correct. Good. All right. Yes, Susan. Okay. Am I muted? No. I'm nope. No, you're good. Okay. Um, so I, with this great turnout of people, um, over 19, um, we, I think if we can get these people to make a commitment to stick with us and work with us with the vestry, you know, we can do this by June or at the end of May right, easily, maybe even sooner. And I would just like to say that although we don't we don't emphasize speed, you know, we want to take our time and do a good job. Right. I mean, these are questions we we're never going to have perfect answers for. But There's can, no perfection, and that's okay. That's right, but and we're close to perfect, but not going to be perfect. <laughs> you want authentic we make the commitment in the next month or month and a half. I think we can pull this off and get it. But it's it, but it's also it's not a race, and I know Marianne wants to say something. It's not a race, and it's okay if it takes a little time to come up with the the answers and the responses that are reflective of who you guys are. Because you don't, I mean, again, authenticity is so important. Yes, Marianne. 
I'll keep it brief. You know, that's hard for me. But uh, I just want to ask one question that I have been confused about in this uh, transition as a new normal. And if we do go as far as up to December, I know some parishes have gotten permanent supply. And you talked about that part of the reason we have this transition as a new normal is it's supposed to not tax volunteers as much. And well, it looks like volunteers are pretty taxed to me and Susan trying to get supply. And if she has to get supply to December and then some parishes have gotten permanent supply. Can you say something about that? I mean, like Christchurch Middle Haddam. I mean, they're not even posted yet, which I don't, I don't understand that. But anyway, don't address that. But Diana Rogers is there as permanent supply. And I, um, so that well, seems like that's an option. So technically permanent supply is not a thing. Right, and, right. it's not called and that. But. We know that there are, there are priests, especially retired priests that have places that they like being at mm -hmm. and they are free to choose to be places. Like, so it's not, it's not sanctioned and we've actually, you know, the bishops are planning on kind of having like a, either faithful futures types things with supply priests to be like, essentially spread the wealth <laughs> that, you know, there are, you know, there's discussions about the equity of it and that, mm -hmm. and I mean, a retired priest, like the poor Northwest corner. I mean, everybody lives, you know, more, most people live um west of the river so you know to get in there are people like i just i don't want to drive out to palm Prairie, or i don't want to drive out to brooklyn or and they they can be encouraged to but the bish i mean the bishops aren't going to tell them you have to go do this so that's kind okay. of its own thing that i think um our new bishop is looking at and okay. trying to figure out what we can do about that okay well i have a lot of thoughts and feelings about that and having been an intentional in trained interim I also have a lot of feelings about that so I'll zip it from there but it's so a lot now, of work, don't be, lot of don't... work for these wardens it's a lot of work for these wardens getting supply and I've heard on the Wednesday morning calls a lot about absolutely supply absolutely. Too. so and yeah. I hope I hope that you know that you sharing that and saying I'm going to stop now makes my little brain say, well, I'm gonna have to reach out to Marianne because I need to have a conversation with her for my dad. I wish again. you would. Joanne and okay. I both did. In, Joanne did interim ministry for 25 years, intentional interim ministry. So, okay. Nope. Thank you. I will be in touch. You're welcome. Anyone have other thoughts and questions? Anne Ray, is your, com is your companion still with you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway we can't hear her no but she had the cutest little puppy with her uh -huh. oh yeah <laughs> thank you that's gracie right grace oh it's perfect come on you guys i know you you've got questions mandy you always ask good questions <laughs> The other questions doesn't no matter. everything seems pretty clear it's um oh so now kate's bringing in a puppy too thank you can i raise my hand yes <laughs> okay so i i think my concern is immediately leaning towards the, the people who are carrying this responsibility amber and you know for from our from our from our end and i just I, I, this being the new method, I'm totally confused in a way about some of the things that you spoke about, not because of the way you did it, because just because of my ADD, okay, whatever I have. So when you say posted, can you tell me what that means again? It means that the, the job is public and we are accepting names and we have we have posted it on these different clearinghouse websites and in these different places to get the word out. So, so we're actively so recruiting. At this point, the gremlins are taking over. The, yeah. the, the church are opening is, is has not gone out. Sorry. Correct. At this point, it is not posted. I mean, people so, here in 
Connecticut know Harrison is gone, but they also know that there's work to be done before they can, you know, a, a new priest can come. So it is post. Anyone want to take a guess? It is the, 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 it, it's in the fish bowl, so to speak. I, I can't, you can't hear me. Mm -mm. Can't hear me. Tony. Um, I guess we're live here. Yeah, Andy, I think it, it's important when we say posted, you have to understand this means it's going out over a national network. So theoretically, every Episcopal priest in the United States will be aware of the fact of our opening. Is that fair to say, Amber? Yep, and anybody that happens to not be in the United States but wants to see what's happening also will see it. Yeah, so my son's yeah. uh, parish in Florida just hired a guy from Canada. Wow. <laughs> Do you have a question? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh? I know there are some good questions out there. Mandy. Benjamin, you always have good questions. That's the second time you ask her. Uh. Can't hear. Is Mandy her. talking? Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Um, I need to take time to digest it all. I'm not someone who can speak up right away, so I need to think about it. Uh, but I second Mary Ann's comments about the job that the vestry is doing, finding the supply priests. And gosh, do we have to wait till December or January? You know, maybe we do. But, um, at, you know, at this point, that's all I have to say. But this has been really informative, but I have to think about it. There's one other thing I wanted to mention that so. If you were on a previous search, you might know the time where if you were taking names, you would get your list and the list could easily have 12, 15 names on it. That is no longer. If we have a list of six strong candidates now, that's considered a good list. And that is numbers that I've had recently in Connecticut in the last 18 months, including coastal Connecticut towns of rectories. Yes. Uh, so suppose that you get just hypothetically 10 names so you will you boil them down to five or six to present no. us no as long as they pass that red flag check call where they're in good standing in their parent and in, in their diocese and they can nope the the vestry will get them all and we oh. ask that the vestry does it at least do that first round because first rounds are zooms so we ask that anybody that felt called to apply get an interview and there might be some where i mean after that first meeting you, you you know right away that that's probably not a good fit um but at least you've talked to them and given them that that courtesy and that opportunity okay great uh, uh lisa i was just amber i was just gonna tag on to that process just so we all understand what the vestry is doing so you get that first list of however many names you do a Zoom call, and then obviously you, you winnow that list down. And then what does the interview process looks like? Look like? Well, it uh, again all depends. If you have narrowed it down to say three or four, and you're ready to bring them all for visits, then you could move to that. If you're still a little unsure, or maybe it's a couple more names, you could do a second round of interviews before you bring. Like you'd only want to bring your like top three. Um, because the parish is responsible for all travel costs if they're from out of town. And when you bring the priest, you have to bring their spouse if there's a spouse. So, because the, they're going to want to see the town and they're going to want to see where, you know, if there's kids, where they might be going to school and all that sort of stuff. So once you get down to like your top three is when you'll, or maybe four, I mean, again, it, it's all relative to the numbers you start with, but um, at that point, and it is, it's again when they're visiting i always say to parishes if you know that a visit might be happening or you suspect a visit might be happening don't like decide that you must go into the church at this point to get the 
linens for washing like just because you see the vestry's cars there like right. Amber, uh, yes michael you're, you you've just you, you've just gotten into a territory that you did brief the vestry on last week and i think it's worthwhile to go back because there's a process of visitation and not visiting that i think is different than some have experienced in the past so can you just go through that detail once sure. we've gotten to that short list um once we've gotten to the short list the vestry will invite candidates to come to guilford uh, vestry members no longer go out to do visits i'm out uh, okay because essentially now you can see any priest preach online and then um, a lot of times you can even see them do a, you know, log in and watch them do a full service on a Sunday. Um, so there's no more visits where the, the, the vestry goes out, but they do ha still have the um, candidates come and visit the, the parish and the town and the church and meet with the vestry. So that's another change. Yes, uh, Donna. Oh, sorry, Michael. No, I, I was just going to say one of the other things that that um, that we talked about, you you mentioned at the vestry meeting, if I am recalling it correctly, is that we could ask the priest when uh, he or she meets with the vestry to do a prayer service or yep. some other event, depending on the circumstances, so that so there'd be that level of uh, of appreciation for the priest's presence in uh, correct right so but thank it, you. it's only for the vestry so again that if you see other cars in the parking lot just keep driving <laughs> okay uh sorry donna no that's okay so michael you were saying that the person that's coming for the interview or the visit can do a prayer service with the vestry not with the parish correct correct okay that wasn't my question, but I just needed clarification. The question was for the Zooms and then for the interviews, is it the entire vestry that's doing that process, those two steps? Yes. Or part of the vestry? No, it is. So the vestry will also be doing, they'll um, develop their questions. And while the position, while we're actively recruiting, they will also do a mock interview with a um, priest consultant who will help them figure out like, you know, we'll come in and have them do an interview and then be like, let's talk about how to make this really work well. Um, and again, every parish is different. A lot like have, you know, the vestries all on, but they have like three questioners, you know, so it's not jumping around. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't hold up things because maybe someone's not available. You have to trust your fellow vestry members that, you know, the information that they're going to share with you following it you know, you have to be okay with like, okay, I missed that. And, but we can't, I mean, to try to get everybody scheduled at one time, you know, is, is impossible. And then we definitely be looking at like, who knows what the timeline would be. So, but it is the entire vestry that can be on those. That's invited to both yeah. the Zooms and the interviews in person. Yes. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of logistics to organize and have in place to get their schedules, our schedules. And with the questions having to be answered, the sooner we do things, the better without rushing, like Susan mm -hmm. said. But um, yeah, there's some work to be done and stay on top of because logistics very quickly get out of hand and then things go very much further than you want them to. And another thing is once the job is, you know, live, then it's a good time for the vestry to start plotting out. You know, it's better to say we have reserved these eight slots for interviews. Mm -hmm. And then if there's not that many or, you know, to let time, it's always easier to give time back than to try to find time together. And that's stuff that the vestry and I will go through when we talk about setting up interviewing. Susan, you're muted. Somebody, can anybody hear me? Carolyn had a question. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I didn't. I was just, um, following up on what Michael said about meeting just with the vestry um, for, so no, my question was answered. Question. Yes, Anne. Well, uh, one of our members of our church created a, a, a box for questions. Um, 
a um, what are we what are we calling it? It's it's a um, you know she made a big box, you know, the, a suggestion box, and I thought it was a terrific idea because I think a lot of people are shy and don't want to get up and speak too much about what their expectations are. I think if you, in the meetings, when you want to talk about your expectations, it's kind of like, I'll know it when I see it. You know, you can sit around and talk about a dream or what you're looking forward to, but it's kind of hard to articulate it for some people. I mean, we could make a list and all that, but I think a suggestion box is a good idea and it is in the back of the church. And I think we, if we encourage the entire parish to, to put in their suggestions, the vestry can take that box and into their meetings and hear what people who don't feel like getting up and speaking can say. What do you think about that, Amber? It's definitely an idea. And I mean, you're right. There are some, okay. like, some people like that will that never, idea. will never talk. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, my preference is, is when people will talk, if they don't want to talk in front of a lot of people, seek out a vestry member you like talking to just because, you know, sometimes putting down one sentence leads to questions or it, it might, you know, that sometimes you have to go a little deeper than just. Yeah. But the do one you think thought. it's a good idea to have it on hand? Or I mean, yes if you or... have it yeah. and it's a part of what happens in the parish, yeah. I mean, I want to put it away and hide it. <laughs> exactly. It's it's out. I mean, I think we, we did not promote it in, in a large way at this point. Not yet. We have not really promoted it. I mean, I don't want it to be something that people would be like, oh, I'm going to do that. And, and I don't want that to be an easy way only... out of conversation. Like, okay. Okay, I understand. I think that's a good point. Yep. Folks, it is now past eight o'clock and I'm going to ask for folks to speak um, and raise their hand if they've got anything else that they would like to. Marianne just asked a question about who checks that box. Sorry, I didn't want to derail the meeting, but that's meeting. okay. That's it's a valid question. If it's Somebody put something in it last week and then said to me, I hope somebody checks this box. Well, we are checking the box. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, other comments or questions? Um, I think we're at that point, Amber, where we can all thank you. Thank you very much. Time. Uh, My pleasure. Look forward to working with you as we go through this process and I we all we all are praying for you because you have 65 parishes. <laughs> if I got the number right, that you're yeah, at the same time. So we're uh, we're we're glad you could find an hour to spend with us. No, I was happy that we finally got to this place. I know it was a a, a staggered beginning, but it's critical to get that stuff taken care of so we know how to move forward strong. So do you have a few words to say to send us into the night? Well, I always like to wrap up the evening with the Lord's Prayer. That's good. Very good. Right. Will you all join me? Feel free to take yourselves off mute so it can just be a raucous. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, heaven hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. come. I will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory. Forever and ever. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amber. Thank, Thank you, much. Amber. Bye. Great Thank job. you. All right. Good job, uh -huh. everybody. Thank you. <laughs>